Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. A nostalgic look back at our favorite Rangers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I'm Tom Browning, along with my co-host Rob Berger. We can be heard on Google Play, iHeartRadio, YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and of course, our website at GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson.com. That's GoTommyBoyProductions.Lipson.com. Please check it out. You can capture all of our episodes on our webpage. You can contact us by just clicking on the contact bar. You can access all of our episodes. You can leave a message. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear about the players that you would like for us to profile. Love to hear about maybe some of the seasons other than the 60s, 70s, and 80s that really made an impact on you as a fan. Again, we will be going off the menu every once in a while. We'll be talking about the current day New York Rangers, the state of the franchise. And again, we love to talk about previous playoff games, impactful trades that took place in New York Rangers history. So wherever you listen to us, please hit subscribe. It's free. So without further ado, here are your hosts, Tom Browning and Rob Berger. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. I'm Tom Browning, along with my great friend and co-host, Rob Berger. Rob, how you doing today, bud? Good morning, Tom. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Welcome back. Thank you. It was great. It was a lot of fun. Had my son in from California, and uh, we got to a Ranger Islander game. And yeah, it was great having the family around. And watching how the Rangers are uh, continuing to, you know, really play respectable hockey uh, thus far, I guess, the quarter way mark of the uh, NHL season. Absolutely. I, I'll, I'm pleasantly surprised, you know, especially with how the season started, about how how well the Rangers have performed this season. As we record this, the Rangers are entrenched in the playoff spot, third you know, third in the Metropolitan Division, um, and if even – and even a point ahead in in the wild card race too. So pleasantly surprised as we live in in the new world of the Buffalo Sabers. <laughs> Amazing, a ten game winning streak, um, and really um, should be the model for how hockey teams should be built right now, as as they are in a great great position uh, going ahead. They are, but it did take them a while, right? Despite all of their early round selections, whether they finish first or second to Edmonton with the lottery, it has taken them a little while to, you know, for these assets to really come together and to, uh, you know, to perform the way they're performing right now. You know, it's you know, it's interesting that that's the um, the big the big debate in in the Sabers fan universe is whether or not it was a tank. Um, to get to where they are today. Um, but this is a team with a ton of youth with three first round draft picks, um, in the upcoming draft, Mm -hmm. a general manager that got Jeff Skinner, um, with who is now, who's tied for the league lead in goals without giving up a first round pick, which is just, he had three first round picks to burn and he didn't even have to use one of them to get Jeff Skinner, um, is amazing. Did his play dip enough over the last year or two to warrant consideration for uh, I don't know, comeback player of the year? I mean, the, the year he's having is unreal. It is. He's on pace for sixty plus goals along. I mean, along with uh, along with uh, Patrick Laine and and Pasternak. Yep. Uh, and what's and what's even more impressive is he he only had one goal through his first seven games, um, and and since then he's just been on fire. Um, he's actually since then he's only had. Um, since that poor seven game start, he's only had two games without a point. Wow, which is, which is just amazing. Like I said, they've won ten in a row, uh, beaten decent competition. But no, you know, Skinner played eight two games last year, scored over twenty goals, um, thirty seven the year before that, and you know he's only had one full season, not kind of the, the shortened strike lockout year of thirteen, where he didn't score twenty goals. So. You know that that this is you know when we talk about the Rangers as, as they are on the brink of what are they going to do with the trade deadline, which we talked about next week, is you know the fear that the Rangers are going to be a cl- become a club like Calgary or Vancouver, which is never great but never bad enough to get a top pick. Yep. Well, you know that's been the Rangers' history, right? I mean that's been their history from um, 1995 to you know 
when uh, Vino took over, you know, after the up until that 2014 season. And since then, sprinkling players at the end of their careers with big money just to get just to make the playoffs. And you know, we're going to touch on obviously our focused personality today, uh, the cat Emil Francis. We're going to talk about him and his philosophy momentarily. But uh, yeah, that's uh, as we discussed last week on the Kachuk podcast. You know, that's a decision. And I thought you were very eloquent when you mentioned that, um, you know, the Rangers are really in a no-win situation right now. And they really have to make a decision over the next six weeks as to what they're going to do. You know, are they going to bite the bullet and do what's best for the long-term future of this organization? Or are they going to be seduced by maybe a, a mediocre metropolitan division as well as maybe some overachievement by some of these guys? I mean, you know, you mentioned Skinner. We're only at the quarter way mark right and you got guys like Kreider too are at you know on pace for blowing out their career high you wonder if they're going to start reverting back to the mean and if you start making decisions based on what they're doing so far and not look at the best interest of the organization long term that, that could be a problem yeah it's you know how much do they want those two home playoff games you know um get to get to get cash in on that gate opposed to setting up for the future i, I don't know yeah just have player the rangers have players to move once we get to the deadline yeah i think they're gonna have to move zuccarello i think they unfortunately i like mcquade but obviously you know, he's hurt i mean god only knows what's wrong with him oh you know i mean he's been out for a, over a month now and all you, all you hear about is upper body injury and you know i thought he did a nice job bringing some of the younger players showing some leadership but you think he'll probably be moved Zuccarello and maybe even Hayes, even though Hayes is having a great year. So, you know, that's a real dilemma. And before we get to email, real quick, though, you mentioned Pasternak. I'm really, I mean, not too surprised that, I'm not surprised at Line A, but Pasternak has been a real pleasant surprise for the Bruins. Well, I mean, he had a huge year last year. You know, he plays on, or at least was, the best line in hockey right. with Bergeron and, and Martian before Bergeron got hurt. Yep. Yeah, and they, they got him at a steal of a contract. Uh, they wrapped him up for a long time. That that's one of the be- the best signings. Um, you know, they wrapped you know six, you know six point seven or through two twenty two thousand twenty three. They got him early. Is great. They also have Marchand under contract for a long time. Um, yeah, they're a um, Bruins are a smart organization. They're solid. You know, uh, nothing too fancy, but they they make pretty good decisions most of the time when it comes to their personnel. You know, they could have. There are a lot of teams that would have jettisoned. Uh, Chara a long time ago because he was getting up there in age but this is the guy that keeps on performing year in and year out and some of the other guys I mean they they very rarely really miss you know one could argue maybe Boychuk when the first year they sent him to the Islanders but he is, hasn't been anything much since then and but they're they're pretty solid the Bruins I have to give them that but um, anyway let's get to uh, the cat Emil Francis um, you know I found you know we haven't focused too much on coaches during our podcast, but I thought this is a guy that really has made an impact on three organizations in his career. You know, the New York Rangers, of course, the St. Louis Blues, and the Hartford Whalers. But with the Rangers, in the modern era, he's the guy that was responsible, the architect, for really building an elite, some say the greatest National Hockey League team never to win a Stanley Cup. I mean, this guy was really something back in the 60s and 70s, uh, Rob, and what are your thoughts on the cat uh, before we delve into some of the details? You, you know, he's such a, a polarizing figure. At least he was towards the time of his exit with the Rangers. Um, you know, when he, when he left the Rangers, you know, it's hard to, to, for a lot of people to remember, he, he had the second most wins in hockey history as a coach. Yeah. Um, and like you said, he, he presided over some good Rangers teams. You know, he, you know we were joking before we, we started recording at you know, we'll never see a I don't think we'll ever see a general manager or a hockey executive like Emil Francis again, uh, firing the coach, stepping in, stepping back, jumping in again. Uh, definitely, we definitely don't see that anymore. And then when, and when he left, uh, you know, the guy he tried to get to, repl- you know, to come in for John Ferguson promptly got rid of him um, as the executive and try to bring him in as coach. But. Yeah, like you said, some good Ranger teams, you know, uh, took took him to, you know, the semis th- uh, four times, took him to the cup final once. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, are they the best team to never win the cup? I, I don't know about that. Uh, definitely the best range. He's definitely prevent, was over the best Rangers team to never win a cup, though. Well, again, I guess it was relative to when he was running that organization. Uh, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't the proliferation of teams back then. Like, there, I mean, there was part of this uh, the expansion era, but I think it was pretty well understood, and I think it was uh, the appreciation was that uh, at that time, with about twelve teams, I guess it was about twelve teams in a league at that time, maybe a little bit more. They were really the team. I mean, Scotty Bowman would say they were the best team never to win. A lot of anonymous GMs would say the same thing, even fellow players. I mean, they were uh, always something came up. Uh, and there's a lot to talk about here. But, you know, you talk about stepping in. To, I mean, he hired three coaches, uh, whether it be Boom Boom Jeffrey on or Ron Stewart or Larry Popeen. And he had to rescue the organization all three times to go back to the bench and Basically, all three times he was able to resurrect this club, and the, and the team responded to him. And and one of the, you know, I remember a couple of the old Rangers were saying that he was able to command respect not only because he was the guy responsible for drafting us, but also for trading us. You know, if he didn't perform, he didn't have to sell it to a, to his boss. He was the boss, you know, and uh, so he really commanded the respect of his players there was a little bit of a fear factor you know he had a little of a little dictator in him there was some would say that he didn't have he didn't utilize the opinions of a large team around him it was basically his way or the highway he had a, a select few guys that he trusted but they were basically yes men and i think that probably hurt him in some of the trade decisions that maybe he made maybe some of the coaching decisions that he made what he said goes but he had a tremendous amount of um, respect around the league. He had a tremendous record. And really, I think it all started, Rob, as a player in juniors. You know, he um, he had a tremendous, he had a decorated career as a goaltender in junior and minor hockey. He was one of the top, he won MVP awards, all-star berths. He had quite a career back at the in the day when there were very few teams, not only in the National Hockey League, but very few teams throughout the uh, North America to play for he was an outstanding goaltender in his own right uh, absolutely you know and, and really you know his claim to fame um is you know is the advent of the new goal of the goaltending glove yeah um which he designed similar to a first baseman's glove from baseball that's right um because the gloves just were no good um when he was playing in the 40s um you know and he was a prolific uh, goaltender just to you never really got it going though uh in the nhl uh, he did play for the Rangers, but very, you know, he was with the club for a while, but played very little. Right. Team. Yeah. He uh, did the Baltimore, I guess, New York uh, shuttle back and forth. Yeah. He played. He got started with the Chicago Blackhawks, but again, he played for two poor clubs, two poor organizations at that time. The Blackhawks were were having a tough time. The Rangers obviously were having a tough time. So it was a porous defense. Uh, so he played at a time where he was seeing a lot of rubber. You know, he really was. And, yeah, he's um, he said, you know, his quick reflexes, he was given the name uh, The Cat from, I guess, a sports editor in Toronto. They saw He saw him play, and he said he had just had tremendous reflexes, which he attributes to playing shortstop, I guess, in high school uh, as a youngster in um, in Canada. And he was very quick. You know, I guess he um, he actually said he got the design of his glove from – a backup Yankee for first baseman. I forget the name of the player, but he um, it was a model. It was modeled after that backup Yankee first baseman, and then uh, I guess he uh, re-engineered it. I guess Clarence Campbell reluctantly agreed after there was a lot of consternation. A lot of other coaches and GMs were upset that uh, Emil had this advantage over the other goaltenders. But uh, Clarence Campbell had a very lengthy interview with Emil Francis in his office and reluctantly agreed. Yeah, well, right, let's make this happen. And he says. The worst thing he ever did was not, I guess, get a patent on the glove because almost immediately uh, Rawlings and other sports um, supply shops uh, started manufacturing and selling these goaltender gloves. Really, he says it was almost instantaneously when he, when he introduced the glove to uh, the league. So he says he could have made a lot of money, a lot of coin doing that. But, uh, yeah, he was very, um, very innovative in his own right. Oh, absolutely. I think it's that uh... – the innovation and that skill that he went straight from playing uh, into a leadership role uh, right away. He started. He was in the Ontario Hockey Association, now the OHL, but uh, in Guelph. Um, and then before you know it, he was he was the assistant GM of the Rangers 
in the early 60s. Yeah, I think 62 he came in uh, and uh, after, before, actually I think he joined before, he became the assistant GM in 62, but before that he was hired on and uh, the Rangers assigned him to Guelph. He says that was his preference. He liked uh, the Inter- Ontario Hockey League. He said he knew the players and he was actually the coach for R- Rattel and Gilbert at that time. So he knew a lot of the players and they said that he really developed some strong leadership skills as a youngster, uh, that he really was considered the leader of, of most of his teams. He had that, that, that leadership quality and that know-how, that management know-how. Yeah, I think he even drove the team bus. Uh, you know, He was really that hands-on, and he was really that much of a, an astute manager, executive, even at an early age, and obviously those qualities – made an impact. I think Chicago Blackhawks was, were hoping that he would stay with them in a management capacity. Absolutely. That, you know, he, you know, that's like one of the reasons he had such a long career in the NHL is that he was coaching and an executive so early in his career to, in a time where you could see you, you had coaches being executives, which is, I think, I can't imagine we'll ever see that again. Um, I don't even know how much input coaches have now on um, on the moves team ma- teams make, you know, it's, I guess it, it depends who's hired first, the GM or the coach, right? You know, who, who whose model they're going to take, and then when you have, you know, you look at the Rangers now. I, I can't imagine Quinn has that much. You know, I can't imagine the coaching staff has that much input on any moves. And then you had a guy like Emil Francis who's doing the drafting, or at least you know when the draft started, yeah, making the trades, and then going back and forth between the front office and the bench. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I can't remember the last guy who was done, even on an interim basis. I'm trying to remember. I know Glenn Sather stepped behind the Ranger bench for a while uh, when he first started, uh, a couple times, I believe, when he was a GM and coach. But I don't think, I can't think of anybody else, Rob. Maybe you can over the last five, 10, 15 years that actually wore two hats like that. Yeah, the, the closest I could think of is. Um, was was Muck through the GM in Buffalo? Yeah, that is the closest I could think of. Oh, Lou Lamorello too. Didn't he? Lou Lamorello step behind the uh, Devils yeah, bench. That, that was probably just for a few games or so. Yeah, for a few games, that's right. It was uh, very very few. Yeah, interesting. Uh, different times nowadays. You know, I guess um, you'll never, like you said, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll never see that again. And but I, some of the the initial you know guys he brought in uh, besides Joe Bear and uh, Rattel was you know Eddie Jockman. He found Eddie Jockman through his knowledge of the players in the Ontario Hockey League. And, yeah, he really built that team, you know, drafting Brad Park. And uh, you, had the, you had the gag line, Vic Hatfield, bringing him in from the Chicago Blackhawks organization. And yeah, he had uh, a real knack for identifying young talent. And I know that before the show, you and I talked about some of the trades that he made. And I know that, you know, one could argue that uh, that might have been a blind spot for him. Besides the coaches that he that he hired that never really panned out. Some of the trades that he made, not only with the Rangers, but maybe with some of the other organizations he was with, maybe were not stellar. I mean, I'm sure he had his moments where he made some decent trades. I can think of a couple with the Rangers that we'll get into in a moment. But, uh, for example, bringing in Bobby Rousseau as a power play specialist for the 1972 uh, Stanley Cup Finals. Uh, Bruce McGregor and Pete Stemkowski he brought in from Detroit. And, of course, he, you know, Bobby Nevin. I don't know if Bob Nevin was already with the Rangers before Emil took over. I don't think so. But, you know, Nevin had won a cup with Toronto. So there were some moves that he did make that were, you know, outstanding moves but there were some real other moves like the Middleton trade um, a few others that uh, really did not work out very well for him and Moose DuPont and that's another one that he regrets to this day not uh, after drafting Moose in the first round not uh, giving him a chance to really uh, develop with the Rangers yeah you know he, he also brought in Eddie Jockerman. Um he he also coached Rattel and Gilbert down, down in Guelph um and quickly move quickly move them up to the big club as well. Yep. So you know, yeah, I think one of the knocks on him, you know, you talk about the moves. I think that his better moves were at the beginning of his regime uh, in New York. Um, right. I, th- I definitely think he's an example of a guy. You know, it's, I think it's hard for a lot of these guys to watch the game change and evolved, change and evolve, and the game evolved so much after expansion in '67 and, and, and into the '70s. And I think that's what hurt him is that he didn't keep up with the league. Yep. Yeah. He. Um, well, I, to, I think I have to stand corrected on the Milton trade. I believe that was John Ferguson who made that trade. Uh, that was Milton for Kenny Hodge. So I think that was after Esposito prodded Ferguson 
I think it was Ferguson who made that Rick Middleton trade, not uh, Emil Francis, although Francis did draft Ricky Middleton. Yeah, some of the trades that uh, he made, I mean, he had a partnership almost, a de facto partnership with the St. Louis Blues. I guess he was instrumental when St. Louis came into the league. They really reached out to uh, Emil Francis for some suggestions as to who should be coaching and, and running the front office in St. Louis. And he had strong relationships with the St. Louis organization. And there was a tremendous amount of trades between Emil Francis and the St. Louis Blues organization. Barkley Plager, who played for the Rangers, and St. Louis picked him up in the expansion draft. He had Red Berenson, who was with the Rangers, who became a superstar with the Blues. Uh, Francis, again, made that, that ill-fated trade, um, trading Moose Dupont and Jack Eagers to St. Louis. And Mike Murphy went in that trade, too, for uh, you know Wayne Conley and a couple of other guys that really never panned out. Yeah, and he, of course the Esposito trade with Brad Park and Rattel, he made, you know, he he had very uneven, like you said, very uneven, some good ones and not some not so good ones with the New York Rangers. But you're right, he didn't really stay keep with the I, I don't think. And I think that's what hurt the Rangers, especially against the physical teams like the Bruins and Flyers. He didn't stay with the trend of the time. He was very much a guy who liked finesse players. You know, but although he did draft DuPont, you know, he knew the Rangers needed some muscle. And they, it seems like whenever he made those moves for some physical players, he just didn't have the patience to let the, let them develop and play out. Yeah. And, you know, and it's funny if you can go back, you go back and, and read New York Times articles from, from the 70s. Uh, spe- the writing style was a lot different then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a little, little, little more opinionate, opinionated, I guess, you know, with the exception of someone like Brooks today. Right. But um they were very critical of, of the moves he made and how he treated the draft, how he treated his players, uh, especially, you know, with the expectations after 1972 uh, and just how things slowly went down here, da- not downhill or quickly went downhill, really. Are there any um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Is there anything in particular, anything in the, from those Times articles, any particular players or any incidences that that were highlighted in those articles? Because uh, that is interesting. I think because um, that was an area that was a, a point in time where the Rangers really, you know, they faltered big time. You know, they they were right there, uh, right before '72 and, and and right after '72, and it just disintegrated from there. Anything that's that stood out from what you read in particular? You know, you know, it's one of the you know favorite titles to an article was uh, from probably about a little less than a year before he was fired. Um, you know, an article t- titled New Ways for Old Cat. Um, uh, you know, you know, he treated you know, trading, you know, um, Red Berenson to the Blues and Red Berenson was um, became probably the best player on the Blues yeah. and, and you know, for their first cup runs. Sillaps uh, sure. to Pittsburgh, uh, Dennis Hextall, oh. uh, you know, you know, uh, Dim Lorenz to Buffalo, you know, he trades like that, that, you know, towards, you know, we already brought up the, the good trades um, that he made. And, you know, another, another critique is, is, you know, how often they made moves behind the bench. Right. You know, there was, there was rarely stability, uh, during the during the Francis era, uh, if it wasn't him, like you said, they bought him Boohoom Jeffrey on, which did not work out. Um, and then he went down, you know. So it was all it was a very very volatile organization, which just got worse. Um, after you know, they made the playoffs for three straight years after the Cup run, but the team just slowly, uh, you know, they uh, you know you can argue that it, they almost won in spite of him towards the end. Yeah, well, yeah, I think by his own admission. It was just becoming too difficult to wear all the hats he was wearing, I think, especially with the advent of the WHA. Uh, you know, we talked before the show that when he was presiding over the Rangers, the Rangers had the highest payroll of, of any team in the National Hockey League by more than two. I mean, they uh, they doubled the – their payroll was double, more than double the NHL at league average. Brad Park was the highest paid uh, hockey player, $250,000 a year. I mean, he was the second best defenseman at that time beside, behind Bobby Orr, but the Rangers, and I think Emil probably had something to do with it, uh, along with ownership, they really tried to keep the WHA at bay. They wanted to keep this this uh, you know this team together, the nucleus together, and they really went above and beyond to spend big money to keep them on the on the team, and probably maybe to the detriment of the um, 
of the Rangers on the ice because they weren't as hungry as some of the other teams. They weren't as physical. And, you know, I think teams like the Flyers and the Bruins, uh, I don't know if there was any resentment amongst the players because of that. But I just think, and I think Emil liked the scouting piece of it. He said that one of the reasons maybe the teams didn't play as well with these new coaches that he hired were because he liked to take these trips to Western Canada to, he'd be a long, he'd be away for long periods at a time. He felt that if he hung around too close to the coaches that, you know, it would be too much like a perceived as a, as a micromanager situation. So he tried to give the coaches as much freedom, as much space as they, as they needed. But obviously the players didn't respect the coaches that he brought in. The only respected email, he basically, uh, drafted these guys or traded for them and as GM not only did he determine how much they would make but he, they would determine you know whether they, they would be traded or not so they there's a little bit of a fear factor with the players with email and he was the only one that that they really respected so yeah I think uh, he just had too much responsibility and wore too many hats yeah but you know um to not be completely negative <laughs> right about, uh, about... Well, listen I love the guy I thought he was great I thought he was great um you know, he, he is, you know, he is a Hockey Hall of Famer. He is. Um, you know, you can argue that, um, you know, because you could, I guess you could have the debate. Is he, is he the best, is he the best head coach in Rangers history? Um, he's definitely, he's definitely, you know, he made it to the Hall of Fame for being, a, for being a builder. Um, unless you're, and let, you know, of the modern area, unless you're going to go back to Boucher and Lester Patrick, really, you have to say he's the, he's the, the best coach in Rangers history. Correct? I agree. Totally agree. He, like you said, the modern, he developed the Rangers into an elite franchise that they hadn't seen since probably 1950. You know, the, the modern era, who has done more for the Rangers, a consistent winner? I mean, the Rangers had some of the best players in the National Hockey League. They never had the best player, but they had a collection of guys that were just elite players, and they were consistent. He wore so many hats, and he really... He really brought you know the New York Rangers into the modern age, and they had a new building at the time, a new Madison Square Garden. They had one of the hottest tickets around. They were consistent, a consistent regular season team. No, I think he is definitely um, and a guy that uh, not only coached them but drafted them. You know, and you know, so you're right. I think uh, he's got to be to me the the greatest all time Ranger executive right now. I mean, who else could even? Be mentioned in the same sentence with him right now. I, I can't think of anybody. I mean, you could argue the two years of Neil Smith, yeah. uh, but that, that that was very short lived. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and not only that, but his impact on New York Metro youth hockey is really, I think, what he'll be remembered for. Um, for for those that don't know, there's the Emil Francis Award, um, which is given um, each year. Uh, to to uh, local youth hockey organizers and volunteers for the great work he he created uh, the Metropolitan Junior Hockey Association. Um, he won the Wayne Gretzky International Award uh, for which is which recognizes those who have contributed to the growth of hockey uh, in the states and just such a huge supporter. You know, you know, looking at the past winners, we've yet to have uh, a winner on on our home of Long Island. Um, but but a lot of a lot of winners from around the tri-state area up through Westchester and Western Connecticut. Yeah, he um, he has done a lot for uh, youth hockey, uh, local hockey in the area, without a doubt. And I mean, uh, he even had the Rangers practicing in Long Beach for many many years. You know, I mean, this was considered a New York City team. Uh, even when the Islanders came on and came into the league, they continued to practice there for a, a, you know. A, pretty long period of time a lot of the players lived in long beach and you no know, so he did uh you know new york city hockey he did a lot of of a lot of good things for local hockey in the area and you know the guy's a hall of famer uh he was a feisty guy you know i remember some of the just things i remember images of him you know he was a, a little guy but uh, yeah, very tough i remember uh back in the day in the early 70s when the bruins were it was the Bruins and the Rangers this is before the Flyers really started to distinguish themselves as the most physical team in the league. And, you know, the Bruins had a very physical club in their own right. You know, Derek Sanderson obviously became a real big thorn in the side of the New York Rangers, although later on he, he actually played for them. And Emil Francis basically told the Rangers uh, the evening before a matinee game, a Saturday afternoon at the Garden, that, you know, we're, we're out to get this guy. You know, <laughs> we're out to because he, he was just that much of a thorn in the Rangers. You know, he was really 
uh, giving Eddie Jockman all sorts of, 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 of heck down low. And, uh, and you know, he really, he really tried to instill some real fire with this team. And he would go at it with the other coaches and uh, against the Flyers with Dave Schultz, uh, you know, during the playoffs, he would actually uh, stand on top of the bench and he would be, you know, he would be, be verbally jousting with uh, – with the players on the, uh, you know, uh, the Philadelphia Flyer players. And so he was a real feisty guy. But the only unfortunate thing was it didn't always translate to the team being as feisty as he was, you know. And like I said, I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that he respected skill. He respected the game to be played a certain way. And then when he acknowledged during the offseason or a moment of weakness, I guess, where he knew he needed some physical players, whether it be Ron Harris or or um, some other guys that he would, even Orlin Curtinback, he didn't keep around long enough, you know, and he needed to to sprinkle in some physical players, but he just didn't have patience, I don't think, for that type of player. And Moose Dupont, he drafted eighth overall in the first round, knowing that, you know, he was the exactly the type of guy that uh, the Rangers needed, but I guess Moose had some eyesight issues, and the Rangers really didn't delve too far into that, and it wasn't until he went to the Flyers that they discovered that he needed contacts, and of course, Moose became an, uh, an elite defenseman, physical defenseman with the with the Flyers, and an intimidating presence, so yeah, I think, um, you know, feisty guy, but didn't always translate into Rangers being a physical team, and but, but, but I agree, Rob, I think he was by far the most successful, inspirational uh, coach and GM the Rangers have ever had. And then he took that on and and did some great things with St. Louis, a team that was this close to being out of the league and then uh, resurrected the Hartford Whalers too. Yeah, you know, um, he never he never got that uh, that cup as an executive. Um, you know, unfortunately, he never saw St. Louis and Hartford even really succeed that much as, a, as an executive, but definitely left marks on those markets. Um and as much of a, as much as he's impacted junior hockey and youth hockey here in New York, he's done the same in St. Louis in building up that area. And, and really the growth of St. Louis hockey can be seen today with all the, you know, the last couple drafts, the amount of kids coming out of St. Louis youth hockey. Didn't he preside over the Blues as president when they had the most points that they ever had as an organization? I thought that he, he was part of some great teams. He was, he was um and you know, I, I want to say he was the the GM when they they made the trade for Brett or the executive when they made the uh, move for Brett Hall. Um, I could be wrong about that. Um, yeah, I think they had. I don't, I don't, I don't think, think so. I think he left the Blues before that. Yeah. Uh, he he was uh you know he's part of the draft drafting of guys like Shanahan and Francis and Harford, um, and building and trying to get that team going for after the move from the WHA. Yeah, he left the Blues in '84. But uh, if it wasn't for him negotiating a deal or two with Ralston Purina, that that uh, that team was out of. Uh, matter of fact, there was some talk that they were going to be going to Saskatchewan, I believe. Um, yep. The NHL Board of Directors or Board of Governors, which I guess comprise of all the GMs in the league, they voted it, voted it down. But you know, he basically um, he did everything he could to keep the team in St. Louis. And I think, uh, like you said, he presided over I think a 107 point season one year. Which I believe might is maybe to this day the most points that the Blues have ever had in the season, or pretty darn close to it. And, uh, and then again, Hartford, I think uh, you know he took that club into uh, made that team into a, a winner for several years. And I think he right, yeah, I think he tra- I think he drafted uh, Shanahan and a few others. Uh, I don't know if Verbeek, Pat Verbeek maybe was one of the players he may have drafted. I don't know. I have to. I'm not sure about that either. But yeah, they. Um, they had uh, some good teams in St. Louis, some good teams in Hartford, and it's good to see that he's still with the Rangers organization doing some special things. And I know he was at the um, Jean Martel night during uh, the banner, his jersey being uh, raised last year, and he'll probably be here in December. Actually, I think it's next this weekend, I think, um, when Vic Hatfield gets his number retired. I'm sure he'll probably, if not be there, I'm sure he'll have a message for Vic, you know, for his retirement, his um having his number retired. So hey, he's in his nineties. He's still going strong. He's still, you know, he's still very active and um, he's still opinionated. <laughs> Listen, I wouldn't mind the Rangers today getting some of that spark. Oh, you're not <laughs> kidding. Uh, yeah, I tell you, I, I, I definitely agree with that. Any last minute thoughts about the cat? Any, um, any trades, anything that we didn't touch on? I'm sure there's so much to the cat that we probably didn't touch on. I'm sure we missed on some, um, some moves, either good ones or, or controversial ones, that one of the things that he was not too 
shy about was complaining to garden management about how they took care of the of the ice at Madison Square Garden. Uh, the Rangers had some horrific injuries in the 70s. Madison Square, Square Garden was one of the, I think it was the only le- team, in, the only uh, arena in the league that did not put down an insulated floor, basketball floor on the ice, whereas teams like the Boston Bruins, uh, they actually put the basketball floor on top of the ice which preserved the integrity and the quality of the ice. And the Garden never did that. The Garden always had to put fresh ice down whenever the Knicks didn't play. And that led to some horrific injuries by Brad Park with, with ruts in the ice. He uh, basically w- responsible for two major surgeries uh, on Brad Park's knees, which really affected not only his career with the Rangers, but ultimately with the Bruins as well. And Del Rolfe had a career-threatening, really a career-ending injury with uh, a similar situation at Madison Square Garden. And... Yeah, the Rangers were always noted, known for having the worst ice in the league, and I didn't realize it was because they didn't put down an insulated floor for the basketball team. And I remember him complaining to the president of the Garden, saying, oh, I see, you know, this better ice in uh, Halifax <laughs> in January on the streets than we have here at Madison Square Garden. The Garden, they were never too happy about his complaining about, about emails, complaints about the, the quality of the ice and the impact it had on his players. But, yeah, he... Um, he was really for his players, and uh, he um, he was not shy about voicing his um, you know his issues, concerns. You know, that's a topic for a, a whole yeah. week of podcasts. How bad you think we think the Dolan Dolan does a bad job now? <laughs> <laughs> the way the Ma- Madison Square Garden ran the Rangers oh. in the seventies was was abysmal. It was. I mean, uh, it, caught, it may have cost them a cup or two. I know it caught in the 50s, right, when they had to play all their home games on the road. Uh, 19, I think it was a 1950 Stanley Cup or 50. Detroit had all the home games. I think Toronto and Detroit both had the pleasure of uh, playing their uh, away games at their home arena, which cost the Rangers some, some Stanley Cup opportunities. Yeah, it was always the circus that took priority over the Rangers, you know, looking back at it. But uh, excuse me. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah, so uh, anyways, very interesting um, topic. Uh, Emil the Cat Francis, uh, a name that... A lot of people my age who followed the Rangers in the 60s and 70s really came to appreciate and controversial figure, you know, hopefully, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how he makes, he does, I hope, and I hope he shows up. I hope he shows up for Vic Hatfield's uh, ceremony. It'll be good to see him again. And um, let's touch on that for a second. Maybe we can have a bonus podcast on Hatfield, but if you had to take, make a guess, are the Rangers going to announce Brad Park as being the next guy to get his number retired, or are they not going to make a declaration like that uh, this coming weekend? I don't think they're going to. Hmm. Do you think they are? I'm afraid you're right, but I hope they do. I think that's one guy that, I mean, if anyone should have his number retired, especially before Hatfield, I think it's Brad Park number two. I'm hoping. I think he deserves it, but I think you're right, Rob. I don't think they will. I, I, I agree with you completely. He he deserves it. Um. I don't know why it hasn't happened yet. Um, I, I think there's some guys retired that definitely should not have their numbers retired before. Yeah. Uh, Brad Park. I totally agree. That's it. Well, listen, I look forward to our next podcast, Rob. Great job as always. I really appreciate it. For the fans out there, again, we would really like your input. We'd really like to have you pass on your suggestions at our, in our website or at our website. Uh, please hit subscribe. We are on all of your uh, favorite podcast channels. So uh, for Rob Berger, this is Tom Browning saying uh, so long for the Forgotten Hockey Players of Broadway. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you for listening. This has been a Go Tommy Boy production.